Hi. So uh, I made a uh, video for assignments one and two for my biochemistry course, and it seemed to go pretty well. So I thought I'd make one for lectures three and four. So, so which one of the following amino acids correspond to a polar branch chain amino acid that is an isomer of isoleucine? So the branch chain amino acids are leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Uh, leucine would be the only one that is an isomer. Which one of the following amino acids corresponds to the description? In this case, it's just a picture. It looks like a sulfur side chain, which is only cysteine. Again, these questions are probably easiest if you have a thing in front. Polar amino acid that can form disulfide bridges, same answer. Picture of a dipeptide. I have two amino acids connected by a peptide bond. Click on the peptide bond. Well, remember, a peptide bond is between a carbonyl carbon and a nitrogen. This is got carbonyl carbon, no nitrogen. Nitrogen, no carbon, nitrogen. It's not part of a ring, so our peptide bond is there. So all I need to do is click anywhere in that vicinity. And that's the one I picked. So move on to the next question. All right, so I kind of teased this one in class. If C++ students are still struggling with it. All right, so we are looking for the hydrogen pond partner of this oxygen here. So oxygens can bind with other molecules that have hydrogens, but not hydrogens that have carb, not hydrogens attached to carbons because those uh, don't form hydrogen bonds because they kind of share the electrons equally. So all of these are not valid. We can just look in kind of the general region. It's, I mean, it's not going to make a hydrogen bond with this one over here, right? This is too far. So move all the ones with the hydrogens. Can it make a hydrogen bond with this oxygen? No, because it doesn't have a hydrogen. This one is missing a hydrogen, right? So it needs a hydrogen. Um, Could it make a hydrogen bond with that one? Technically, yeah, but not that one. Not that one. That one doesn't have a hydrogen. All right, so our candidates are, we're just looking at nitrogens with hydrogens. We'll see. Well, I guess that one's plus. All right, so we have one, two, three, four, five. And this is a beta sheet. It's it's going to make a hydrogen bond with a nearby neighbor, correct? So I would say it's going to make a hydrogen bond with this one right here. It's the obvious connection. Um... So my answer is, I just click right there. That's where it's making the hydrogen bond because that's what it's asking for. Click, All right? Click on the single atom of this oxygen would make a sink, make a secondary hydrogen bond structure with it. So you could click on the N or some anywhere in between. So um, the way these hotspots work, you just click clear and then you can click there. I'm probably pretty sure I just put a box around this entire area. So. Yeah, you know, don't click like here and hope to get it right, right? You know, clicks, you know, click here, probably can click there. So somewhere along those lines will get you the correct answer. On the alpha helix, amino acid number eight would form a hydrogen bond. Well, this is what we talked about in class. So one forms a, okay, maybe it's just labeled this way. <clears throat> so we have an alpha helix, right? And it's going to remember it forms these backbone hydrogen bonds. And we talked about it in class well, one will form a hydrogen bond with number five, which will then form a hydrogen bond with number nine, which will then form a hydrogen bond with number 13, right? Two will form with six, 10, 14. Maybe I switch colors here. Three will connect to seven, 11, 15. I'll hydrogen bond with one another. Um, four will connect to eight. Oops, I should have spaced these out. Twelve, and then sixteen. What was the question? Number eight. Oh, okay. Well, it's going to hydrogen bond with four and twelve. So, boom. That's the answer. Match each of the following protein structure with the corresponding description. So. 
Arrangement of subunits into a protein complex. That's what we usually refer to, quaternary structure. Intermolecular peptide bonds of a linear. Linear is the key word there. Amino acid chain, that would be primary. Complete three-dimensional conformation. That's what we refer to as always tertiary when it's three-dimensional. Angular orientation between adjacent. Adjacent is a good keyword for secondary structure. Some of these times you can kind of pick out keywords uh, to do the matching for this question here. All right. Histidine has three pKa values of 1.82, 6, and 9.17. So this is something you need to know. This is the one that has a pKa of 1.8. We always know... The carbonyl carbon, on, if this is amino acid, amino acid, the carbonyl car, uh, carboxyl carbon, it's always going to be the 1.82, uh, is going to be like in the 1 to 2 range. The amino part of the amino acid is going to be in the 9 to 10 range. That was type 7. And then the side chain here uh, is going to be in, uh, for histidine, is going to be in the physiological pH, so close to 7, in this case, 6. So... All right, so we are asking for pH 1. All right, remember, as we go down in pH, we're going to be in the HA form. As we go up in pH, we're going to be in the A-. minus. So because we're all the way down at pH 1, everything is going to have a proton on it. So, in fact, the one that's showing here is the correct answer because this one's got OH. This one's NH3+. plus. That's the most protons it can have. And this one's got two H's. Uh, which is also plus. So that one is the most protonated it can be. So. And so let me, why don't we take a look and scroll and look at the other ones and talk about why they're not correct. All right, so this one here, we've lost an H on the side chain as well as on the C terminus. So again, at pH 1, we're having all the hydrogens. This would probably be uh, the most appropriate at pH 7, pH 8, etc. Here we have lost the hydrogen. We've lost the nitrogen. We've lost it. So this one's lost all its hydrogen. So this would be probably closest to pH 13 or anything higher than 9.17, really. This one here has a hydrogen, has a hydrogen, but it's lost this one. So this is not really a species that's very common. You'd probably find it. Uh, but it's because it's protonated here, that usually requires a pH of less than 1.82. But it's deprotonated here, so it requires, uh, so it's pH greater than 6, but it's also a pH of less than, um, so pH of less than 1.8, right? Sorry, it's, I should have wrote it like this maybe. So it has a pH of greater, it requires a pH of greater than six and 1.8. So it's kind of a rare species. It does happen, but it's not one, it's never going to be the most common one. And then the last one here, we lost the H, we gained the H, um, gained the H. This would be anything where the pH, so if the pH is greater than 1.8, but also less than six would be the appropriate one here. So anyway, so the correct answer was A. The one that has all the protons uh, because we are at such a low pH of 1. All right, last question on amino acids. In an alpha helix, the hydrogen bonds. Okay, so let's just kind of diagram this out here. Remember, the hydrogen bonds are kind of in like this. Another key important thing of uh, alpha helices is that the side chains, the R groups, stick out which is kind of the opposite of DNA. Um, which why is why Linus Pauling had some challenges uh, trying to solve the structure of DNA, one well, we could argue. The alpha helix, the hydrogen bonds, are roughly parallel to the axis of the helix. All right, let's see. Okay, I can go for that one. Are roughly perpendicular axis of the helix. Well, no, they're kind of going in the same direction. Now, the side chains are perpendicular. Are curler mainly between electronegative atoms... Of the R groups, no, they're they're between the backbone, not the R groups. Occur only between some of the amino acids of the helix. No, pretty much all, all of them are involved. I mean, not the ones at the end. Uh, only between some, only some implies less, but most of them, other than the ones at the end. Well, the ones at the end will still have one of the two hydrogen bonds, so they're definitely participating. 
occur only near the amino and carboxyl terminal helix. So actually, we have less in those areas. So I would say the opposite is true. So anyway, so again, the correct answer here is the first one. Let's hopefully, I got them all right. Again, you know, feel free to reach out on Discord or in the comments uh, if you want me to clarify more. Okay, so now we have a second one on protein purification. Cool. I just updated this one to kind of make it a little bit more clear. I put some gray background and uh, color the unknown in yellow just to kind of be clear here. Okay, so the question is, we have an SDS page experiment. Uh, we have these seven protein markers. Uh, the proteins are separated by molecular weight, and the gel shows these standard proteins. We have an unknown protein that we ran in a different column. We measure the distance uh, from the gel, from the well of these proteins. So 2.71 is the protein we measured. So that falls in between these two proteins here. Oh, wow. We get a pretty big range we're working with here. <clears throat> uh, so one of the questions I like to ask is, well, what's the difference? So 2.88 minus 2.71 equals about 1.0.17. All right. And then we have 2.71 minus 2.49. All right. If it's 12, that would be 61. So it's actually 0.22. This is a log scale, so if you really want to crack it down, you got to work with a log plot, but I am not going to do that. Um, so basically, we're a little bit closer to maybe the top one. All right, what's the what's the average weight between these two? So it's 26.5 20, divided, sorry, so I meant to do a plus. Uh, it's the average. Um, so that is, I'm just going to have to do the math in my head, so... About 69.5. All right, so that's what, 34.75. Correct me if I'm wrong there. All right, so we got 34.75. Um, if we're ignoring the log scale, we probably go closer to the 43. So I'm just going to go so a little bit higher. I could go 35, 36. I, you know, I'm not looking for exact numbers here. Uh, I think 35 is probably going to give me the right answer. All right, next question. This is an image of a 2D gel. Proteins are subjected to isoelectric focusing in STS page. Uh, we are looking for the location of the protein chymotrypsin. Chymotrypsin has the second highest electro isoelectric point. Um, and in terms of molecular weight, we're 25, five, da, 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 it's kind of the third highest, it's 43 and 175 are above it. So it's kind of like, uh, I mean, some of the key things we got to consider on this thing is which direction is which, um, so as we know, if we're below the PKA, we're going to be positive. If we're above the PKA, we are going to be negative. So uh, this is going to be the high pH side. And this will be the low pH side. Uh, further all, molecular weight gets uh, smaller as we go down the gel. So, um, so here is going to be high molecular weight. And then at the bottom here will be low molecular weight. What I said that our protein was third biggest, so it's probably that one. Uh, I told you it has peak, its peak, um, its isoelectric point was second biggest, so it's for that one, right? One, two, and then one, two, three. So that one's our protein right there. Uh, so all we need to do is click on it. Boom. And that will be our answer. If you click on the wrong one, you want to redo it, you can just get the clear. Oops, that's what it tells me when I try and click on it twice. Boom. Um, a little bit of leeway on the clicking there, hopefully. All right. I don't know if I put the challenge one on this one here, too. 
Uh, but pyruvate kinase has an isoelectric point of 5.6 and a molecular weight of 60. The protein in the table above is placed in a buffer solution of pH 4.5. Uh, it's important to note if pH is less than the pi, then it is positive. Gosh, I'm feeling this is one of those things I like to double check. If the pH is greater than the isoelectric point, then the protein is negative. All right, so our pH is less than the pi, so I'm going to say it's positive. I mean, the way to remember it is it's kind of like with pKa's, right? If you're, uh, once again, if you are, if the pH is less than the pKa, um, then your HA, if pH greater than the pK, then A minus, which means you're a negative charge, or in this case here, it might be a positive charge. But basically, you know, the higher the pH, the more negative, the lower the pH, the more positive is really take home here. Um, and I'm going to ask that question a thousand times in this class until students can get it right consistently, I guess. All right, so here we have a lot different, a lot of different cell disruption techniques. Might require you to consult the lecture slides a little bit. Handheld cylindrical glass tube, spinning pestle, tight fit. That is my dounce homogenizer. Lysozyme digests gram bacteria bodies of cell walls. Lysozyme is an enzyme, so. Um, numerous samples are processed simultaneously using bead beater machine. Simultaneously, that would involve being high throughput, I could say. So that would be C, motorized device with rotating blades that shear cells apart. I had a nice picture of that one. Um, it's got like a drill almost. This technique uses forces of ultrasonic waves to rupture cells. So that's the process of ultrasound or sonication, if you will. Sorry. It's... Um, and so that one is E. All right. Next we have... The more complicated isoelectric point problem. I don't put this one on test because uh, I just I get myself wrapped in knots with this one for whatever reason. All right, we're at a pH of 7. So if you, let me write my rule. If the pH is less than the pi, then we are positive. If the pH greater than the pi, then we are negative. Assuming I'm right, if not, I'll just redo the video. All right, so for apropotein, um, where are we at? So the P isoelectric point is 9.2, our pH is 7. pH is less than the PI, so we're going to put that one as positive. Actin, the PI is 5.3, the pH. So in this case here, the pH is less than the PI. Or, sorry, the pH is greater than the PI, so Boom. <clears throat> and if I did that correctly, it should be obvious here. So both, so APR will be positive and travel towards the negative and AACT will be negative. That's the one I derived. So we'll see how that turns out. All right, so this one, match the following types of macromolecules corresponding components of processes. Each choice will be used exactly once. So 2D gels involve isoelectric points. Isoelectric points are only present in proteins uh, because DNA is always negatively charged. That's a DNA always negative because of that phosphate backbone. So isoelectric focusing fails. I mean, it's just, it's just not going to work. Um. Gel red stain involves that ethidium bromide, which only binds to nucleotides. So gel red will not work with proteins. So that's how that one works. And then page it forms is polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. And like I said in lecture, 
While polyacrylamide gels are usually reserved for proteins, they work just fine with nucleic acids. Um, so that one is available for both. And remember, choices are used exactly once. So if it doesn't make sense uh, for one of the others, it's probably both. Last question, column chromatography. All right, so we have hydrophobic interaction columns, affinity columns, gel filtration columns, and ion exchange columns. And we need to differentiate um, the different types of columns here. Ability to separate protein samples by size using porous particles. Separating by size, that is gel filtration, or sometimes called size exclusion. Uh, involves the isoelectric point, so that's going to bind charge binding to a positively charged anion exchanger. Anion exchanger, ion exchange, nice connection there. All right, next one. C, separates proteins according to differences in their surface hydrophobicity. As you remember, hydrophobic interaction columns mostly work with the surface of the protein as opposed to the reverse phase, which kind of get really uh, into the hydrophobic. And then finally, D, separates proteins on the basis of reversible interaction between that target protein and a ligand. Anytime we're talking about a ligand, we are talking about affinity columns. So that is that question. Save and submit. And we'll hope I got all the questions right. Correct. So, oh, didn't tell me the answer. Got that one correct. You can see, clicking on that one there. Positive charge. Matched all those correctly. Assigned the proteins correctly. Assigned the column, oh, sorry, the uh, gel components correctly, as well as the column chromatography. So hopefully that was uh, useful. Uh, for learning the material and I will try to find the button to stop.